So hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts. I'm Frederick Dunn and this is The Way to Be. If you've ever wondered about how honeybees communicate inside the hive or why a waggle dancer might receive a stop signal, then this interview is for you. Today, my special guest is Dr. Heather Brockert Bell. Heather is currently working as a honeybee health researcher at Nod Apiary Products Limited in Ontario, Canada. Here's Heather. I am Dr. Heather Brockert Bell. I'm a honeybee health researcher for Nod Apiary Products in Southern Ontario. So between Toronto and Ottawa is where our manufacturing site is and where my offices are. That's fantastic. And I want to thank you for joining me tonight because I reached out. I have so many questions for you relevant to not what you're doing so much right now, although we are going to come full circle to that. Uh, I want to talk to you about not the broad scope of honeybee intelligence, but some of the specific things that you've learned about through the years and given presentations on. And one specific thing that got my attention was your observations about audible communication inside the hive. So would you like to give me a quick kind of rundown about um, how you ended up doing that kind of a study and why it was appealing for you personally? Oh, well, that's <laughs> that's asking a lot. Um, how did I actually end up there? I've always been interested in animal behavior and my PhD is in animal behavior, but the animals that I was studying in my PhD were things like rats, but I also studied crickets and fish. And I was, yeah, I was studying. Can we stop for a second? Sure. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but you might want to get used to it because when I hear something that I want to know more about, I don't want it to get stale. So rats, uh, this, are we talking about like the Norway rat? Or are we talking about lab rats? Uh, well, they are the Norway rats, but the ones that I was studying were a specific strain of those called long Evans hooded rats. And they are laboratory rats. Yeah. Yes course. So what I wanted to know about, because I did a little studying up on rats, because we had a rat around here for a while that I was trying to keep an eye on, and they're very, very smart. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he looked at the night cameras, he only had one eye that reflected back, so I named him Igon. And this led me down a path of how do rats communicate, and then when I learned that they communicate ultrasonically. Mm -hmm. as part of that. Could you explain a little bit about how uh, rats communicate, what that means, and, and how they use their communication? Um, uh, to be fair, I don't know tons and tons about it, but our lab was studying the ultrasonic vocalizations, and essentially there are two frequency ranges, and I don't remember what the numbers are on those ranges right now, but basically the high-pitched ones were the sounds that they would make, and neither one of these we can hear. You have to use a bat detector to hear them. Um, mm -hmm. The high-pitched ones, though, are what they make when something good is happening to them. So whenever, if they're, if they're doing something positive and the classic or sort of classic way that where people talk about this is there was a, another researcher who was studying rat tickling. I don't know if you've heard of this guy before. Yuck Pangsa. <laughs> yes. So he figured out that rats make this high pitched sound when you tickle them, but they also do it in other uh, context where there's something positive happening to them, something mm -hmm. that they enjoy. And then the lower pitched one they make when there's something negative essentially happening to them. Um, now, what what do these communications actually tell other rats? It's hard to say. And to be fair, I haven't been in this literature for like 15 years now. So yeah. I'm a little, a little bit out of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that answers. Well, I'm sure question. those who have tuned in to hear about honeybees are really going to appreciate the ultrasonic frequencies and use of rat vocalizations. Uh, it's just personally interesting to me, but <laughs> no, you did mention something. If you wanted to record something that's putting out a 20,000 cycles or above uh, audible frequency, what would we use to record those sounds? Yeah. So what we used in the, in the lab, like I said, was something called a bat detector. And, and essentially that's exactly what it sounds like. You're it's, it was developed for recording vocalizations of bats, which are also ultrasonic. And really what it does is it just records sort of normally. And then the playback is where the, the magic happens. It's essentially slowed down to a frequency where we can actually hear it. Yeah. That, that is really interesting. And that led me to, and some of my viewers will appreciate this. Uh, I captured a short-tailed shrew and uh, they also echolocate and they use 
ultrasonic frequencies. And are you, you probably, this is not your. <laughs> I don't know anything about short-tailed shrews, okay. but I want to know more. But the, I was excited. And the reason I went on that path is I was looking for a way to record their vocalizations because I want to hear it. And mm -hmm. uh, we know that we're limited to 20,000 cycles unless we're, you know, vampires or something. I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I thought, you know, I would use a normal recorder and then just modulate it down. But, you know, they're not even picking up the frequency to begin yeah. with. Yeah, so, because because they're normally topped out uh, like at the range of human speech. So they, yeah, like there's no sense in adding. Yeah, exactly. Why design a piece of kit that will record something that will never be used? So absolutely, I'm, I'm going to be looking into the bat detector. So this is already paying off for me personally. You know, to be fair, actually, I think an analog recorder might actually work because the problem comes in when you're doing digital recording because then you you have a Fourier transform that's filtering out those frequencies that aren't really useful for right for us so possibly an analog recorder but don't quote me on that <laughs> okay i won't quote you nobody's listening we're just, <laughs> we're just talking so okay now we can move on to the rest of what you were trying to explain all right now i can oh yes how did i get to studying what i was studying um so yes i was studying other kinds of animals in my phd and i was studying how they interacted with one another so it, this was normally pairs of animals and they were almost always fighting about something so in my master's degree, I was actually studying play and I was studying play in rats. Um, so like two way interactions, essentially partner based things. And I was curious about what happens when you scale that up to larger systems. So actually, originally, I had intended to do a postdoc in ants. And when I went to go talk to the ant guy, I had some ideas. I like to do computer modeling stuff. So I went, when I went to go talk to the ant guy at UCSD, which is where I ha was targeting, um, he, he didn't really like the modeling idea. And he said, well, you should go talk to the B guy. So I, I went to go, went to talk to the B guy who is Dr. James Nye. And he was really interested in the things that I had done and it fit well with in his program of study. He has been studying communication for a long time. Um, he was actually one of Thomas Seeley's graduate students. And so that then the rest is history. I spent seven years researching bees and that's actually how I got into to studying bees was in his lab and then so you've kind of stayed with bees ever since right yeah so, it was it was great so something about bees uh must have really stuck with you and for those who don't know you know they're related to ants so yes these social I'm insects. An and we talk about these uh audible communications this again I'm going to derail a little bit Somebody was recording the tapping of aphids mm. and they had to develop these transducers that, you know, were in direct contact with the branches that they were on and it was picking up. You know anything about that? I don't I don't know the specifics of that. I suspect that what they were using was similar, similar to what we were doing, which is um, using accelerometers. So you're actually okay. using something to measure force effectively. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now they, I don't know so for do sure. That ants, they, do ants do that too? They make these little tapping communications and stuff? I don't believe that. I, I don't know of any ants that do that specifically. They they do antenate. So they, they use their antennae to, to feel things. But I think that that's mainly chemical sensation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm not aware of any ants that are, that are using vibration, but it is possible. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Do continue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't remember what I was telling you now. <laughs> well, then the ants led you to bees because yes. you were referred. Okay. Yeah. So, so I ended up in, in bees studying communication, um, been there ever since at when we decided that we wanted to move back to Canada, which is actually how I ended up where, where I was. Um, then I was looking around for a job in academia. Uh, that that's where I thought that I would end up is, is, uh, doing, being a professor somewhere and, jobs in animal behavior, especially if your specialty is bees are few and far between because my background is actually psychology and neuroscience. So it's not, it's not biology or, or, you know, anything or, or like more applied things, which is where a lot of the bee related jobs are going to be is, is more applied things. Um, so no biology department would hire me because I don't have enough biology background and psychology and neuroscience didn't have the research capacity usually for me to house bees. And that's what I was interested in studying. I actually wanted to continue what I was doing with James. So I started looking in private industry 
and happened to come across this job with Nod, which uh, touched on a bunch of different things that I was interested in. So now I get to develop products to to uh, to treat Varroa mites, which, I, which actually feeds back into the communication part because you know Varroa are actually reading honeybee pheromones. That's how they do a lot of the things that they do within the colony. So this is an aspect of communication. I mean, I was studying vibrational communication previously, but now I'm moving on to pheromonal communication as well. And it's all related. Mm -hmm. And so you want to explain what NOD is? Yeah. So uh, NOD stands for nature's own design. And we develop and manufacture um, sustainable beekeeping products. Right now, our, our three products are two formic acid based Varroa treatments, and then we also make a, a, a an insulated winter wrap called the Bee Cozy, for and that's more for like northern climate, Canada beekeepers and and northern United States. And so the product that you're talking is, do you make Formic Pro? Is that what's coming out? We do of yes, okay. yes, we make Formic Pro and Max. Um, Formic Pro is gradually replacing Max. They're pretty much exactly the same. The only main or the main difference is that Formic Pro has a longer shelf life. So when we started selling our product in Europe, it became prohibitive because we our, our product only had a one year shelf life. So by the time you manufacture it and ship it to Europe and then it gets distributed to where it's going, like half of the shelf life has been used up. And, mm -hmm. and for a treatment that can only be applied at certain times of the year, this is not that useful. Mm -hmm. And now the shelf life for the new formula is two years? Two years, yeah. Okay. And I do have a question about that before we get back to the, the communication that I'm so interested in. But uh, when we're past the shelf life on Formic Pro, what happens to it? In other words, uh, does it become dangerous to the bees? Is the off-gassing not controlled? What deteriorates? Um, the thing that actually limits us from selling it, and, and that's where the limitation is, is really us selling it, is that the packaging starts to degrade. Okay. So if the packaging fails, then of course it's off gassing when you don't want it to be in. And, and some of your product, you know, there's the potential for it to be spent before it actually gets into the colony. And so that's, that's fully what it is. It doesn't become dangerous or anything like that. Just be, if it's off gassing, it might be less effective when you put it in. Oh, I'm glad. I'm really glad that I asked that because um, anecdotally people were reporting that when they used it off, you know, label, in other words, it was past its expiration the package degraded as you described, but then they were saying it delivered too strong a dose over too short a time and had this big impact on the bees. So we can say that's not the case. Not as far as any of our data shows. And okay. we tested it far outside the range of what it's actually registered to be applied under. So, mm -hmm. so what's anything new coming up with that formula? Um, not with Formic Pro. I, well, actually, that's a lie. Uh, I mean, I, we're always kind of working on it. I am, like I said, I was doing, or I, I, like I didn't say yet, but we're doing testing on using it in different hive styles. Mm -hmm. So we get questions all the time about, for instance, top bar hives. And because Formic Pro, because Formic Acid is a vapor, the mm -hmm. shape of the cavity that it's being released into actually really affects how it works. And we don't know a lot about, it was developed for use in Langstroth hives. So we don't know a lot about how it works in other hive styles. So this summer, I'm running some trials on Layens hives, which are not top bar, but they are similar in that the frames fit tightly together, which is different from a Langstroth. Of course, there are spaces in between, and that affects how well it works. Mm -hmm. We have some preliminary data to suggest that it'll work if we hang it down uh, between the frames rather than set it on the top bars, which is what the current product label specifies. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening with Formic Pro, but um, we're also working on other things. I actually have, for the last couple of years since I started with Nod, been working on oxalic acid um, with, with mixed success, let's say. Nothing is coming down the pipeline anytime soon for that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're, we're gradually investigating other things. And then other products that aren't for Varroa control as well. So we've got a few other projects going. Mm -hmm. well, with the oxalic acid, are we sticking with the apobioxal? What, what's the formula? Uh, it's something different. It would be a, it would be a slow release. That's actually what we're trying to, trying to oh, work on. Anything yeah. like Randy Oliver's extended it's, release with glycerin and. Yeah. Roughly based on that similar type of concept, but uh, we, we haven't had a lot of success. And I know people who've been doing testing on 
um, well, things like a Lewin cap or Randy's method, you know, the results are fairly mixed on that. It's hard to get consistent data. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, now with like Jennifer Berry just ran a big study and I'm waiting for some results from that to see, to see wh what direction we go in. Okay. Yeah. Cause I could see um, if an extended release formula were developed and approved and, and then it would be something that could be packaged with a dose already fixed into some kind of material that would be on the shelf ready to use. Right. Is that kind of the thinking? Yeah. Well, uh, like this is, this was the impetus behind developing Formic Pro and Max was well, and, and the previous generations, which were might away and might away too, mm -hmm. um, was to try to reduce the, the danger to the beekeeper really to make it more convenient and easier to use. And again, less hazardous like formic mm -hmm. acid, as you know, liquid formic acid is quite dangerous and, and, um, Oxalic acid, probably a little bit less so, but still, it's still an organic acid and still it can be quite potent and quite dangerous. And yeah, we would try to, we would like to try to limit that. And then of course, your results are much less variable if you have something that's sort of prepackaged and ready to go and you can reduce a lot of the error yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah, I could see that being something that consumers would really want and they can do away with all the measuring, saturating, yeah. getting the dose right. Um, so let's jump back a little bit to the Formic Pro packs. Uh, I saw a presentation recently uh, where they were suggesting, you know, we have the option to do two packs at once or then do one after the other. And what I want people that are watching or listening to really think about is whatever we mentioned here, you really are going to follow whatever the current labeling is at the time that you see this video or listen to the podcast. But uh, it was suggested that if we went with one at a time, it had a lower efficacy with the varroa mites that were under capped pupa. Uh, that is what our data suggest. Okay. Now we don't have definitive testing on this. Um, it makes logical sense. Like the concentration of formic acid will be lower because you have less of it entering the hive at a time, but we do not actually have direct data to say that for sure. We have some data on Max, the previous version, um, where they applied one strip and then compared it against two strips and looked at at uh, below the cap kill. So they basically did uh, an operculated brood biopsy. It's called where you uncap cells and you count varroa underneath. And they did show that yeah, there was it was there was a lower efficacy there. It still did. There was still an elevated kill rate relative to the controls, but yeah. So, so that's what I'll say. We don't have definitive data on it, but it's highly suggested that yes, that is the case. So that may have been not the current formula. That was the old one. That year. was the max. Yeah. So that, okay. that's what we have data on. Is on okay. Yeah, because so, yeah. science takes a while to catch up. And by the time okay. these are being delivered in a presentation, the, there may be some new formula already out. So that's really interesting. And I know because it's so popular, a lot of beekeepers use it. We're at the time of year when a lot of people are going to be using it because varroa mites are on the rise in spring. Right. Spring is the best time because the temperatures are still good. Yeah, that's the other thing. It's very restricted as far as uh, the temperature parameters go. Uh, and that's because it relies on being volatile, but not too volatile, right? That's so right, yeah. It too hot. That's when people have a thousand bees piling out the front. So another thing that uh, people should know, right, when they're thinking about Formic Pro, um, it really goes as an application for a strong colony. You wouldn't want yes. to put that on a nucleus or, you know, something. No, well, yeah, I, I know that people do. They use it off label that way, but yeah, that's not not the official way to, to apply it. Um, and yes, I, even our label says a minimum of 10,000 bees, which is about six frames of bees. And mm -hmm. you really need to have strong colonies. Um, since I've been working for the company, I've applied it many, many times to all of our research colonies, and I have never had any major incidents, but our colonies are all very strong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a number of commercial beekeepers that work in the company. So we have uh, high level beekeeping skills, I'll say, mm -hmm. not me particularly, but the, okay. the beekeepers among us. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it really, it's a product that, yes, you need to have the sufficient, the colony strength to be able to move those vapors around efficaciously. That's really what you're, what you need. Okay. So, and so you say, would some colonies not have a bunch of dead bees out in front of it when you use Formic? Uh, no, I, I mean, there is always 
we there's have, always we going always, to be because that's alarming yeah. some people are alarmed yeah. but they don't really understand that that's to be expected that's absolutely to be expected to the yeah. level that you know some people that have been using it for a long time if that doesn't happen then they're concerned then they worry it may not be effective at all yeah. right? and the impact on queens what can you tell us about that um, yeah, so it's a, another thing where I'd say you need to have the strong colonies. Um, but yeah, there, there can be, you can't, we can see supersedure, especially if it's sort of a weak queen. Um, yeah, so th that can be an issue, but as long as you apply it at, a, at the appropriate time, then, mm -hmm. you know, the, as long as there's sufficient time for them to requeen themselves or for you to requeen or whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but certainly in the, again, in the two years that I've been working here and applying it a lot, um, I've never noticed a sufficient or a, a, an excessive amount of queen death when, when we've been applying it. Okay. What about sublethal effects like reduced fertility and things like that? Uh, to be fair, I haven't specifically been measuring those sorts of things. We haven't been doing studies on those exact effects. I, I'm hoping this summer so when I came on board, I was actually the first scientist for the company. So we're gradually building up a research program as, as time goes on. So I, I've been spending the last couple of years learning more basic beekeeping and actually expanding the research yard. So I'm hoping that starting this year, we'll, we'll get some more studies out the door. Okay. Well, that's really interesting stuff and, and valuable because it's what people think about all the time for road control. Now let's get to the fun stuff communication inside the hive. This is what um, was really interesting to me is we were talking about, or you were giving a presentation um, about the waggle dance was occurring and then a, another worker bee. <clears throat> and I'd always thought that it was one of the storekeeper bees inside the hive that would ram the side of uh, whichever bee was doing the waggle dance, some forager that had just come back with their resources and uh, they beep them several times. It could actually stop the waggle dance and interrupt the information that's being shared with the other bees, which we assume are other foragers. But you mentioned something in your presentation that really got my attention. And that was that the, the bee that's doing the ramming may actually have come from the same site and has wants the waggling stopped because there could be a predator or the resource is depleted or something like that. Would you share a little bit about that? Yes, so that there seems to be at least two scenarios under which this, it's called a stop signal when, when this gets delivered by another forager. And number one is they've had a close encounter with a predator. And number two is if the site has become crowded. So if there's a lot of foraging going on at the site. So both of those are scenarios in which foraging at that spot is no longer efficient really for the colony. So uh, of course, number one, if you're getting killed by predators, that's not efficient. But number two, if there if there's just too much, um, you know, too much activity at that at that resource, then maybe it pays off to find a different spot to forage. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so it was actually my supervisor James, Doctor Nye, who who did uh, studies like determining that that was actually what was happening. And for the predator one, I always lo love those studies because what he did was he set up. He trained bees to feeders and he would sit there and he had a little motorized caliper that would apply like a very specific amount of force. And he would basically pinch the legs of bees that were going to this feeder and he, he would watch them and they would go back to the colony and they would issue stop signals to the dancers that were advertising that feeder location. That the idea that he came up with that experiment to begin with is really interesting to me. I have to assume that they marked that forager in some way so they would know which one had been exposed to that that treacherous yeah. leg grabber so they would go back. Can you yeah, explain? Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was, I was going to tell you how they did it. Is that what you were going to ask? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> what it involves is having a bunch of graduate students and they all sit under an umbrella, usually in the Californian sun. Um, waiting for foragers to visit the feeder that's sitting on a table in front of them. And as the, as the bees are feeding from that feeder and, and you try to, uh, you try to reduce the amount of traffic that's happening there because eventually that's going to get super crowded. But at the very beginning, you can individually paint the bees as they're feeding from that sucrose or as they're uh, not necessarily feeding it, but uh, taking it in anyway. 
So you can individually mark them with whatever paint dots you want. I mean, similar to queen marking only less, even less so, because we're just using like a piece of grass with some, with a dot of paint on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, as they're individually identified, then you have another uh, graduate student watching the observation colony inside for them to return and noting what's happening when, when that happens. That is now, can you explain how this beeping, let's talk about how they get that information to the waggle dancer. They're ramming it. What else is going on there? Ah, so there seems to be two components to that stop signal. Um, number one is the, the frequency. So the beeping, and that's about a 350 Hertz beep. Um, and that is audible actually, even without special equipment, you can hear it if you know what you're listening for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were using what are called omnidirectional microphones. So they're basically a microphone on a stick and we could get really close to individual bees. And again, this is happening in an observation colony. So this is a totally artificial situation. Um, and the observation colonies did not have glass or plastic or anything on the front. So we would take that off so that we could actually access the bees right on the comb. Mm -hmm. So you can hear it with the, with this microphone, but you can also hear it with your with your naked ear, if you know what you're listening for. Mm -hmm. So that's one component. And then the other component is the headbutt. So it seems like probably it's the, well, it's probably both of those things together. However, we were able to create an artificial stop signal that had the same effect that would also cause the waggle dancer to pause by simply vibrating the comb next to the waggle dancer at that 350 mm -hmm. Hertz. And okay. that's probably not that surprising. So we've known for a long time, since at least the 80s, that essentially any vibration to the, the comb will cause bees to freeze. Okay. And that's through conduction, not convection. That's right, yeah. Okay. And so that's interesting. So you introduce that 350 cycles vibration to the comb itself, and then any bee that was in physical contact with the comb would stop in place? Well, it doesn't go very far. So when we, the, when we made sure that we replicated the physical properties of this signal, so we made sure that we measured these stop signals to begin with. So we had like the, how much the, the comb would vibrate and how far those vibrations would go. And when we created our device to replicate that, we, we did that same thing. So it doesn't actually carry that far. If you're, if you're considering the force that's generated by one B and these, Vibrations are created by bees like popping in and out their carapace. Mm -hmm. So like the, um, on their, um, at thorax. <laughs> yeah. I knew what you uh, meant. Yeah. <laughs> the middle, but the middle bit. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, they, they can only be so loud. So really, if you, if you contact the comb next to a bee that's waggle dancing, it basically only affects, well, the light in here is really bad. It basically only affects that one bee that's standing like right there. Yeah, and that's that's practical. We don't want the entire colony to shut down, right? So having right. that vibration attenuate rapidly as it gets away from that focused action uh, would be a benefit, really, right? Uh Are there any kind of um, vibrations or communications that are designed to sweep through the entire colony at any time or where one bee picks up and like echoes the same vibration maybe uh are there instances um, where they need to get the attention of a lot more hive mates yeah certainly in, in swarming contexts so things like uh, a buzz running i believe it's called um when when the hive is getting ready to swarm then you have these uh individuals coming in and they're sort of like buzzing and running through the the high uh, the colony just before everybody takes off and and exits the colony. Are those? Uh, I'm sorry. Did I yeah. No. Go, go on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I call these cheerleader bees uh, because, like the swarming, which I really love to watch, and I have observation hives, so I can see them do that. They're grabbing uh, other bees and oh. vibrating them, and then they run to another one. They grab them, and they vibrate them. Is that what you're referring to as buzz? Ah, uh, no. That's called the shaking signal. So what you're uh, talking about. Yeah. So it's, not a it's not a cheerleader bee. It's the shaking signal. Yeah, the shaking signal. And we're not really sure what the shaking signal is all about. It looks very intentional. Uh, sorry, just give me one second. I'm going to turn a light on here. Okay. Okay, that's better. And did you paint that dog portrait? <laughs> no, my friend had that made for me. <laughs> okay. a is, that a, is that a greyhound? 
It is. Yes. I used to own a couple greyhounds okay. off the track. N nice. So you <laughs> adopted greyhounds. Yes. Okay. Back to bees. So. Okay. Yeah. So the, <laughs> the dorsal ventral abdominal vibration is what that, that shaking signal is called yeah. officially. Yeah. Um, we don't, we don't yeah. know exactly what it's about. Um, Dr. Nye again, did some more research on that one. And he saw that there were peaks of activity in that signal, like at the beginning of the foraging day. And it seemed like at the end of the foraging day, but I, when I was there, another thing that we did was we did censusing of communication behavior. And I have like five years of census data where we would go into to observation colonies and just basically record what they were doing for five minutes. We had five different signals that we were looking for. Um, and so I have this giant data set and I did not see those peaks. So whether or not it's the case that that they peak at the beginning and the end of the foraging day. The published data says they do, but <laughs> but I have other data that says maybe not. So. so what are the five signals that you were noting? We were looking at the shaking signal, um, something called tremble dancing. So if Oh, yeah, that's when they need to unload their nectar. Yeah, and it seems like it seems like tremble dancing happens whenever there is a uh, something negative that has happened to the bee. So whether that's because their nectar isn't being offloaded fast enough or something else negative has happened to them. It seems like a, a broader signal than simply the nectar offloading thing, although that that does seem to be a consistent finding. But they also make stop signals when they when they do the tremble dancing, too, which hmm. is interesting. Yeah, so uh, lots of tremble dancers are also just beeping stop signals at the same time. So there was shaking signal, tremble dancing, stop signaling, waggle dancing, and then there's another behavior called the grooming dance that we were looking at. There's a groom. Oh, does that mean they need to be groomed? Uh, groom again, <laughs> it's, it, yeah, that's what people think. I think that it's both a solicitation for aloe grooming, so asking other bees to come in and help groom them, but also that it it's also kind of when they are grooming, when they are self-grooming, it also just, they're adopting this, this behavior. It looks a lot like a tremble dance. Hmm. Um, a tremble dance, they're, they're sort of vibrating back and forth. A tremble dance looks like a, like a disorganized waggle dance. And then a grooming dance looks like a disorganized tremble with like a, a roll. It, it took me a long time to see the differences in between those, um, but they certainly do happen in different contexts. And did they get a response? Were they were other bees? Did they did that trigger them to groom that bee? Uh, we didn't specifically ask this question, so that was just part of our censusing. We were just counting to see how many behaviors were happening in a specific amount of time. Um, I always wanted to run more more specific observations on grooming dances because I'm not con convinced that that's actually what's going on there. But yeah. It's unfortunate because there's a ton of stuff we don't know about honeybee communication, mm -hmm. especially vibrational communication. There are not that many people studying it. And I wish that there were more because there's so much work to be done. So many questions to be answered. Hmm. Is that uh, because there may not be a, a practical application for that knowledge? In other words, is this just knowing because we want to know? Or... Yeah, I, I suspect that's part of it. Uh, it is hard to get funding for it. I know uh, like over the seven years of of my postdoc with Dr. Nye, I don't think I ever had full funding for a full year. I was always having to teach classes on the side to um, to pay my rent. <laughs> and so during those studies and observations, what can you describe one thing or a couple of things that were really kind of mind expanding that you just thought, wow, that's what's going on? Hmm. I don't know that I had any, well, well, I guess the culmination of all of my studies was a paper that we published last year. And, uh, that's the, the outcome of the studies that I was probably talking about in the presentation that you watched me give from five years ago. Um, I was talking about noise, I believe in that presentation. Yeah. Um, the title was noise. What is it good for? So yeah, I think that was Google that. It was at Merced, I think that talk that is where I was giving that talk. Um, yeah, so it took us most of that seven years to figure out how to test the hypothesis that we had, which is a fairly involved hypothesis. I won't get into the whole thing, but um, essentially the honeybees make the stop signal and maybe they do it 
at times when it's not necessary and what's the reason for that are they is it just an accident or is that functional in some way we had some ideas about how it might actually be functional and those ideas are related to how other kinds of biological systems are organized so things like how brain cells work together they they do similar kinds of things and maybe for similar reasons so just to develop the the technique to be able to test that hypothesis took us a long time. I spent at least three seasons trying things that didn't work at all. So you were talking earlier about uh, being able to, to vibrate the whole comb and how that wouldn't be useful. We tried that and yeah, it uh, just le led to absconding mostly. <laughs> so absconding. Not, yeah, we didn't do it that long, uh, you know. Once our first colony absconded, I said I didn't really want to do that anymore. It seemed like they didn't really like that. <laughs> so you can create a, a stressful environment for them and drive all the bees out. Yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> if you if you wanted to be mean to bees, I guess you could do that. Now, I have an application for that. I, it just dawned on me. Uh, often people have bees inside the wall of a house oh, or yes. where they don't want them. If you... Oh could induce a signal somehow that would make that uh, stressful to the bees to the point that they left voluntarily, wouldn't that in itself be a valuable tool? Hmm. That is an interesting idea, isn't it? Hmm. I guess as long as if you could, I know some of those, the, the, some of those colonies in people's walls are gigantic. I don't know if you they are. And, and people of often try a forced abscond, but they're using, you know, you know, bee robber, and they're trying to use, you know, obnoxious smells to get them out. But how much more elegant would it be if someone just showed up with some very sophisticated vibration yeah. making mm. tools? You, you're in an area that because, um, wow, the amount of work that would save. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, I guess you'd still have to get in there and probably get all the comb. And well, stuff you do because there. it would be like leaving a dead animal behind. However, <laughs> At uh, least especially if it were a spring recent occupant, you know, uh, they wouldn't have built a lot of comb. They wouldn't have a lot of resources. Um, I see that as a very valuable and practical tool. Mm. Well, something to think about for sure. Yeah. We just right here, right now. This is why it. this is why you put this stuff out on YouTube so that we get credit for the idea now. <laughs> nobody, can, nobody can say, ah, I knew that. So, but does that sound like something that would be almost feasible? I think it probably would be feasible as long as the vibration that you produced wouldn't like ruin your wall, I suppose. <laughs> Okay, so no, we don't want to set up a fundamental resonance in the structure and drop no. like a bridge or something. Okay. All right. So there's enough of that. Um, so let's talk about how do bees sense vibration? Can they pick up on airborne sounds as well? What are their limits? Sadly, no. Bees cannot appreciate music. So you can play all the music that you want to your hives. They can never actually sense it. They they use two methods to sense vibrations. One of them actually is airborne, but you have to be really, really close. Mm -hmm. um, the main one though is through their subgenual organs, which are just below their knees. So they have a special uh, vibration sensing organ on their legs, which is why vibrating the comb works really well when you're trying to tell bees something or, or when you're trying to use a signal. So when bees are signaling to each other, not only are they vibrating each other's bodies, but they're also usually vibrating the substrate. Um, so anytime that we're delivering artificial signals, when we do that, it's not really that unnatural to do that. That's a way that they would normally sense it. The hmm. other minor way that they can sense some close range vibrations is with the Johnson's organ on their antennae. And that's airborne vibrations, but that's actually displacement. So it's not pressure waves. Uh, when humans sense airborne sounds they're sensing pressure waves the johnson organ all that senses is basically if you if you stand really close to a speaker right you can feel the air moving mm -hmm. so that's near field sound so that's what the johnson organ can sense is near field sound so that movement of the air at the absolute source of the sound mm -hmm. i'm, I'm going to ask a question i should not ask um there is something called tanging do you know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. 
Okay. Um, because, and the reason I shouldn't ask it is because there are people that hold fast that this absolutely works. And there are people that say, once you understand how bees can hear, this would not work. Uh, it's when bees are swarming and they're in a bivouac location or they're assembling in a bivouac location and somebody goes out and clanks together uh, pieces, their hive tools or pieces of angle iron and it's called tanging and they think that the bees sense that mechanical energy of sound through the air and then the bees come down and move right into whatever hive you want them to move into. Is there any reason that you would think that the bees should be or could be responding to airborne sound like that? Um, I would speculate that if they're responding to anything in that context, it isn't the airborne sound. It mm -hmm. may be something else. So, you know, they can see pretty well. They can, they know when things are moving around around them. And I don't know if you're clanging together some metal stuff, it's probably making some bright flashes of light. That may be more, more of a, an impetus, uh, yeah, as as far as I know, they would not be able to sense the clanging. Okay, I just had to ask. Because <laughs> as soon as I say that, you know, somebody will go, but I do like the idea that they might be seeing the motion because that it would be a repetitive kind of a rhythmic motion that might get their attention, right? Yeah, well, they certainly are phototactic, so or positively phototactic, so they're attracted to light sources. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so they're not being attracted to the sound of it's not replicating thunder. No, I don't think so. Yeah, me I neither. Mean, that, I had to say I, it just because I knew in advance you'd be on my side. I had to. <laughs> I'm happy to to have data to the contrary. So if someone wants to prove me wrong, then <laughs> okay. Show oh yeah, my did. mind is always open. You know, yeah. I'm happy to be proven wrong. You know, I did try it. I went out and I tanked bees and I got stung right on the temples. So <laughs> yeah. Did not work for me. Um, so what else goes on communication wise within the hive? What? Uh, oh, I know what I, you did work with bee intelligence too, or not? I guess. I guess it depends on how you define intelligence. Uh, oh, well, here we go. I know that's probably <laughs> a big topic. Um. But, uh, all right, so I was told, here's the problem. I recycle information that I don't really know to be valid sometimes. It just sounded good when I heard it, so I say it over and over. Bees can count to four. Yeah. <laughs> is that true? I, that, I mean, is I, there any basis for that? Yes, there are published papers on it. Okay. Um, people do claim that that's the case. I... I'm rather conservative when I interpret animal behavior. I don't know, my training or my personality makes me that way. So if there is a simpler explanation that doesn't require a, a really sophisticated piece of cognitive machinery to be operating, then that's what I'm going to default to. Um, can they count? Maybe. Um, I, I'm also the person that thinks that like a whole bunch of human behavior is uh, is much simpler than what people think that it is so it's not because we have fancy big brains that we do some of the things that we do it's actually it's simpler explanations <laughs> oh, so we're not as sophisticated as we think we are uh, you know sometimes we are we have amazing brains they're they are pretty sophisticated but you know some okay. sometimes not no <laughs> so then my thinking that if a bee can count to four then i should not line up beehives in numbers larger than four hives together <laughs> Yeah. Because here's my here's my okay. I'm just gonna. It's just us. We're just talking. So, um, because when I was lining up nucleus resource hives, if I put three or four on the same rack, even though they're some, they look pretty much alike. The bees are zipping right to there. They're straight into their colonies. There's just no hesitation. They're going right in there. And then, so I was thinking, if if we thought that that was the limit of their ability to count, that four is that's all the fingers they have, or whatever. Then mm -hmm. if I put five or six, <laughs> now they're, they're going to be a little confused and maybe we would kick off more drift. Maybe, but maybe they're not having to count to get to their hive to begin with. Maybe they're just saying like, okay, this is my house because that tree behind it is like this particular angle away as landmarks. opposed to the one next door. Yeah. Yeah. So landmarks. Oh, that's a good question too then. Uh, if people wanted to help their bees orient, let's say they had no landmarks flat landscape, just the hives are there. Uh, 
putting marks on the front of their hives, uh, high contrast, very basic angles and circles or whatever, what would be the best kind of marking to put on a hive? Certainly, yeah. What you just said, high contrast, um, it, you know, bees can probably see more colors than we can. They, they well, kind of. Uh, their their color spectrum is shifted into the ultraviolet range, so so they can see colors that we can't see, but then they also can't see things like red. So, yeah, using using basic shapes is going to be your best way to differentiate. Um, so if you have a bunch of patterns, but of course, if you have like 200 mating nukes and you're trying to differentiate those, you can only do so many patterns. Yeah. So at that point you might want to be using colors, but just, I would just verify that whatever colors you're using are something that bees can actually see really well. What about three dimensional? Like if you did cutouts of a star and a cutout of a square and a cutout of a circle and glued that on the front. So now it's a physical dimensional piece. Would that be easier for the bees to distinguish than just colors? Um, I can't say for sure. I mean, people have done lots of research on pattern recognition and bees are, bees are pretty good at recognizing patterns and shapes. And actually some of the people in my lab were even working on that. So training bees to, to fly to specific shaped feeders. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't necessarily know that that would be better or worse than just using high contrast patterns, but maybe if you're looking for more options, um, yeah. All Certainly right. anything that's big and salient, I, I think, you know, offers and any kind of landmark that you can give them is going to help them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were some observations made about bees actually navigating more by horizon line features than the actual sky and sun's position. Uh, yeah. Instances, which is how they can find their way in a rainstorm. Mm -hmm. I'm always yeah. amazed to see bees <laughs> flying through the rain and landing on a landing board in the pouring rain. Uh, so yeah. they're definitely navigating by something aside from just the rays of the sun. Right? Yeah. Well, they can use polarized light too. So you don't actually have to be able to see that the comes sun. That through to... the clouds. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, just like any other animal, they're going to be using more than one sensory system to navigate. It doesn't make sense that you have an animal that only relies on one sensory system, because if that thing fails, then that you just get mm -hmm. lost and that's not really useful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what else can you tell us? that's interesting about what goes on inside the hive. Oh, what else do you want to know? <laughs> oh, just pick your pick pick something that's fun to explain. Oh, well, okay, I'll tell you something that that is kind of a mystery. So, at, at the first year or so of my work in in the Nye lab, um I essentially just got to sit in a trailer full of observation colonies and just watch these things and we were trying to decide what avenues we were going to pursue to test this hypothesis that we had. And so I was practicing with my omnidirectional microphone and I was just following bees around and listening to them to make sounds. And we noticed that every once in a while as we were doing this, that we would hear a sound kind of like a cat purring. So it was just a like a rhythmic purr sound, like a vibration. It's actually pretty amazing. So if you listen to bee colonies, they don't typically make a ton of sounds. You would think that there would be a lot of buzzing and stuff going on, but they're actually pretty quiet except when they seem to be intentionally signaling one another. So this purr sound was really obvious, but we could never really find the source of it. And we scanned and scanned and scanned and days and weeks and months trying to find what was making these occasional purr sounds. And eventually we came across bees that were resting. Oftentimes they'd have their head in, in a cell, but sometimes they wouldn't. And if you looked at them really, really close to you, and we used high speed video to, to actually capture this, you could see that they were vibrating their wings ever so slightly. And to this day, we have no idea what that's about. Um, I did notice that on some of those bees that we actually located, they had almost a retinue, like a, a you know, the, the retinue that follows the queen around and attends mm. to the queen. So they had, it seemed like some observers, I don't know if they were exactly attending to that bee, but they were certainly paying attention to that bee more than they were to the other bees around. Whether or not that's a true observation or just uh, you know, my bias, I, I don't know for sure. So that's a mystery, we have no idea. And I've never heard of anyone else talking about that particular- Were you season. able, did you get a recording of that? I do have recordings of that. Yeah, I have video and audio recordings of that. 
is there a place where uh, people could go online and they could listen to some of these recordings or are they just not available? Uh, I don't have them uploaded online right now, but I can certainly make them available. So I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's just under my name. Um, yeah, and... is that the one with your cat drinking the water with it? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> so are you are you then suggesting that you might be uploading some of these things to your personal Yeah, I can, I can upload it to that, yeah. That's fantastic. So for those watching and listening, the link will be down in the video description so we can catch up on this. And I highly recommend that you see the cat drinking with its paw. <laughs> that, that, that was interesting. I have all kinds of videos of my animals. I also have a cat that plays fetch. I have a video of that. And then they, they pant just like a dog when they get tired. <laughs> when they're Yeah, I had a cat that did the same thing. I made it fetch an aluminum foil ball that I... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's cool. And the purring thing that's really interesting, and I really hope you do put that up because, you know, I don't, this has no practical application for us, but, you know, I'm a huge fan of just knowing things and just being curious about why they do what they do. And this isn't going to help us get more honey out of our bees, but it's Probably definitely going to deepen our appreciation of what's going on inside the hive. Yeah, uh, it's it's a... Uh... It's amazing how little we we know, especially about vibrational communication. And of, then, of course, there's all like the chemical communication that happens in the hive, too. Sure. It's, uh, and I we would that's... say that's their number one communication, really, is the fact. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's sort of something that's always going on. And every bee is is giving off pheromones all the time, just, you know, different cocktails of pheromones doing different things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would I would tend to agree. But but the, the vibrational stuff is is happening a lot too mm -hmm. now when you're recording vibrations and noises coming from hives is there uh often people will say when they they took the inner cover off and they knew there was this whir, and they knew right then it was an unsettled colony and uh there was no queen present is that mm -hmm. something you've come across uh interestingly uh because my background started off in academia i wasn't i wasn't hanging out with beekeepers I never heard that until I started working for the company that I work for now, which is populated by beekeepers. So mm. that was the first time I'd ever heard of the idea of a queenless roar. Um, mm. But now I certainly think that I can hear that. You know, again, maybe it's just because I've been told that that's to be expected. Um, so, yeah, so I never investigated that with the with the equipment that we were using to look at vibrations. It's an interesting thing that I would like to do now, though. Mm. Because it would seem that uh, if we had the ability to, it's almost like, okay, here's another thought that I just had. Cornell University has this, uh, I'm studying ornithology there too. And uh, they have this audible system. You record bird song and then it identifies, helps you narrow down what bird that is. And a lot of birds even imitate other birds. So that's a very interesting thing. But how interesting would it be if we had a database so that when we hold that recorder up, your phone, whatever, with the app on it, and you recorded that little roar or you recorded this beeping sound or some anomaly within the hive that it would go, aha, uh -huh, you're queenless. Mm -hmm. Is there People are any... working on that. They are. Okay. Yeah. There's a number of companies that are using machine learning on vibrational sensors in okay. hives to try to figure out what's happening. Um, so far, I think that a lot of those companies are limited by the fact that they're staffed by engineers who don't know anything about bees. So they know lots about computers and programming and developing machine learning algorithms, but they don't actually know about the, the behavior of bees. So I think that that right now is limiting them. I don't think that that's always going to be a limitation because I think they'll figure that out. Mm -hmm. So then when they see, or just like any algorithm, once they start to hone in on it and they see repetition of those good results, then that yeah. can actually be a, a tool of the future, maybe. Yeah. So, I mean, it's an, it's a, it's another of these big data applications. So we get enough, you know, enough recordings from enough colonies and over time, the machines learn the patterns there. And then if you have input from beekeepers saying like, oh yeah, that was a queen, this colony, then that teaches the algorithm like, oh, okay, this is the set of parameters that, and this is the the value of the parameters when it's queenless. And then we can make predictions about that. And another thing I've noticed sometimes, um, workers will spread their wings and it's not like K wing. Uh, they just tend to like when they're uptight or not happy with whatever's going on in the environment, they'll just spread and all their wings spread out. Have you 
Do you know on the that? on the comb surface or at the entrance of the hive? Um, no, they seem to be on the comb. It's when you get into the hive and start inspecting. They seem yeah. to be walking freely over the surface, but they just have this spread wing posture. That, they're not tremble dancing, are they? No, they're just roaming around. They're just doing and, that. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't specifically noticed that, um, or I don't specifically know anything about that. Mm -hmm. Because that has led me recently to when I see that, then I look for the queen. And I look specifically for eggs to make sure everything's okay. And often that indicates that uh, somewhere they're building queen cells and uh, the queen is either recently absent or about to be absent. So mm, interesting. Know, uh, and it's not through every colony. It's just that when I do see that, that, that that's been, usually related to the outcome. Yeah. Well, I'll certainly watch for that this year. Okay. Yes. I got something in that's going to be. <laughs> so, um, and you're you're doing research and development at Nod. Uh, is there anything there that you want to share with us or talk about? Um, anything oh. coming up that's cool? Well, I'm trying to redesign the the bee cozy, so that insulated hive wrap. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying to make it a little bit more sustainable. Right now, it's just made out of sort of standard insulation and 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 uh, poly material. So we're trying to update that a little bit. Uh, that should be exciting. How does that wrap? Uh, up the hive? Is that Velcro? How does it attack? Uh, no, it's a, so it's actually a one solid piece and it's kind of like a sleeping bag in that it comes all sort of vacuum sealed and, and compressed. Then when you open up the package, it expands out and it's just, it's sort of a ring and there's, we have ones for eight frames, one for 10 frames, singles and doubles. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to insulating your hives in the winter, which at least in Ontario happens we don't usually put the wraps on until like mid to late December, honestly. Um, it's really more of a spring thing. That's that's where it becomes important. You just take your the lids off, slide that wrap over top, uh, make sure that it's positioned properly, and it's mm -hmm. it's pretty pretty good to go. So yeah, it's all one piece. So when you take the lid off, the telescoping cover, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. Yeah. Is there some like folding aspect to it where it goes? Or, so what's insulating the top of that hive, I guess? Okay. So there, yeah, there's two pieces of, of it. So there is the, the wrap. Um, you do have to fold the top down a little bit just to get it to fit snugly under underneath the, the telescoping cover. Um, and then uh, along with the, that wrap part, we actually do have a, like a top insulation, like a square pad that just fits under the outer cover. And what kind of R factor would we get off of that top insulation? I believe the R factor for all of it is eight. R8. I'm not mistaken yet. And they're black, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's also contributing to the effect because on the sunny days, of course, that heats heats up better than the white of the normal box. Right. So it does transfer that heat through then. So even through the insulating material. Yeah. Okay. That's it. How are sales on that? The same growing. Um, they're always growing. I'm actually running a study on them right now. So this winter, I set up a study, uh, partly with, to test to test out this new design. But then I thought, well, why don't I just run a a study on wrapping? Because there's actually very little data on on wrapping. Um, there, somebody just published something last year, but that was the like the first thing that's been done really substantially since like the 50s. <laughs> Nobody has really looked at it. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm running a study where I have unwrapped colonies mm -hmm. and then colonies wrapped like fully wrapped with the top and the side insulation. And then I've also got a group where it's just top insulation. Okay. Um, and that's so ongoing or? That's ongoing. So ongoing. that should, I should, so I have data loggers in all those colonies. So I've got like humidity and temperature sensors in, like I've got six in each group and I've got four different groups. So it's quite a few. Did so you have those on through this past winter? Yeah. I, and I've been weighing them throughout the winter as well. So we've got a little a hive school, scale that uh, we've got modified stands and I've got the special hive scale that I can just slip under. It's actually a really cool design. It's this guy in Nova Scotia, I think, that designed these. It's called Hivetronics. Um, and it kind of has like a pump jack. So you have to have a little space under your colony to get them under. But it's certainly a big step up from the traditional ways to measure to weigh colonies, which was uh, involving like tripods that you would hoist them up on or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's way easier. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've been I've been weighing them. I've got these sensors in there. We'll unwrap them um, and hopefully compile all that data by around June. Interesting. So are you um, observing foraging behavior between the insulated and the non-insulated hives? Like for example, on these 
warm days that we get where it hits 35 degrees, but it's sunny. Um, I've noticed that uninsulated hives, the foragers come out earlier and tend to be more active and productive, while the more insulated hives tend to, it's almost like they're unaware that things have warmed up outside. Have you had any kind of correlation like that? Oh, uh, I, I haven't specifically looked at that, but that's interesting that you say that because I was actually out in the yard yesterday doing my mm -hmm. weights and, um, and we took some feed out to, to the colonies there. Um, we do open feeding. So we, we brought out barrels of feed and I, I thought that I would leave them closed because I didn't really think it was warm enough to be foraging. It was about 10 degrees Celsius. So what mm. is that in Fahrenheit? 50 something, I think. It, high fifties. It's not very warm. <laughs> that is warm. That's warm. If it's sunny and 50, that is more than warm enough for foragers. It, yeah. it was overcast. So I, I didn't think that I would see much. Um, but you know, then there were bees around. So I opened up the, the barrels and there were foragers, but I, I didn't specifically note whether they were coming from the, the covered or the non-covered hives, but next time I'm out, I'll look. Cause that's what, it, that's what I see here. Um, yeah. I see the uninsulated hives warm quicker when the sun, they're all facing south. So, um, and they forage much earlier, sometimes hours earlier than the insulated colonies too. But then the, you know, the argument could be made that, well, the ones that aren't foraging because they're insulated also have more resources in the hive yeah. and maybe they don't need to forage. But, yeah, I, uh, like it totally makes sense because insulation doesn't necessarily mean that you're warmer. It just means that whatever temperature it is inside stays that temperature for longer. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very so much to learn. That's the yes. good. That's the good thing about bees. If we knew it all, what would be the point? Why would exactly? We <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you for talking with me and and giving us so much interesting information and kind of a lot to think about. Uh, even though we don't have the answers, I think it's really great to stay curious and learn about the bees and uh, follow researchers like you. Uh, is there anything that you want to share or talk about uh, before we close out? Oh, no, I think that the, you know, I've been studying animals for like 25 years. And I think that the the closer that I look at animals, the more interesting they become. Actually, not even just restricted to animals, organisms, things that are alive. Um, you know, the more intelligent they become, um, not necessarily with complex cognitive capacities, but, but, you know, they can do more interesting and flexible things. I think that's all fascinating. And the more that I study things, uh, the more questions that I have, I don't actually really answer any questions. I just generate more questions and, and that's what keeps me going. And I, you know, I think that's the great thing about, uh, about science in general. Okay. One thing about yourself, nobody knows. Oh, <laughs> uh, do you mean nobody in the world or just nobody? Well, you know, people speaking. in general don't know this about me, but I put my thumbprints all over, you know, <laughs> Oh, something that I'm... you do that uh, is interesting that nobody knows about. Okay, well, something that not very many people know is that I really like, well, that's not true. I was going to say that I really like <laughs> woodworking, but that actually quite a few people do know that. <laughs> I know how to drive a, a standard car. I know how to drive. Okay, <laughs> and I understand that those are just going out. Like they want to yeah. be making the standard transmission. What kind of What kind of woodworking are you doing? Oh, all kinds of woodworking. Um, are we talking artistic work? Are you sculpting? No, it's construction. <laughs> oh, construction. Okay. I, yeah, it's mainly I, I own this house that's uh, that was built in 1890, so I'm like redoing a whole bunch of it, but also like building um, hive components and stuff for for work. So, uh, yeah. If you have woodworking skills, I mean, every beekeeper that can have a concept and bring that to fruition in their own wood shop, it's an enormous advantage. Uh, so that's great. And I just want to thank you so much for your time. I had a great time talking with you. So thank you so thanks. much for having me. It, yeah. it was really fantastic. Great. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So we're back. We fooled you and we thought we were closing out, but we're not because we're going to talk about a recent study that was published that a lot of people might be curious about. And that was uh, foragers that come back and do their waggle dance. And then, of course, whether or not bees are learning waggle dancing or if it's something that they're just born knowing how to do. What can you tell us about that? So this was research that was conducted in the lab that I was in in San Diego at, at uh, UC San Diego in conjunction with some some Chinese researchers that uh, did the majority of the of the actual experimentation. 
And they basically showed that bees that could observe other bees waggle dancing had more precise waggle dances when they were adults. So forever, most bee, re bee researchers across the board and most people in general just thought that waggle dancing was something that bees were basically born knowing how to do. So mm -hmm. they would go out on their first foraging trips and come back and just somehow be able to know how to do waggle dancing. And the first hint that that might not be the case actually came from a Japanese researcher, um, Hiroyuki Ai, I think is his name. Hiroyuki Ai, that was his name, um, who had some, just a few preliminary observations a few years ago. Um, and I, I, this is part of what drove this current study was he actually came and visited the lab and then they started working on it. But yes, this idea that these can perform observational learning. And again, this isn't new. Uh, we knew that bees could, could observe other bees and learn how to do things. Uh, we, we knew about the string pulling and the, and the soccer playing bumblebees. But this is the first time this has been demonstrated, number one, in honeybees, and number two, for a behavior that is, a, quote unquote, a natural behavior that is ubiquitous and was ubiquitously considered to be innate. That's your whole story about it? I think so. And who discovered the waggle dance? Is that Von Frisch? That's Carl Von Frisch, yep. Okay, see? Thank you, Carl, but he didn't give us the whole story. No, he, so yeah. That, that's really interesting. I'm glad we revisited that because uh, the idea that they can observe and learn and improve something that they, we know that they would do it on their own, it just wouldn't be as good. Yeah, and and it's it's not really that they're improving on it; they're just adapting it to local conditions. So one of the things that we know is that the the waggle dance changes depending on where the hive is. So what are what does the landscape look like around the hive? We know that the the sort of the waggle run, for instance, I know people always say like one kilometer equals one second on the waggle run. Well, that's not really true. It depends on where the hive is and how close the resources are. If bees are used to traveling long, long distances to get to resources, you know, they can't they can't waggle dance for like 23 seconds in the hive. It's just not going to happen. Or even the complexity of the environment that they're Absolutely. waggling you know, it can increase the cycles. That's really interesting. And it just proves that bees are endlessly interesting and in that they're smart. Are they the largest brained insects? I don't think so. Their their brains are about uh, 900,000 neurons, I believe. Okay, so what's mistaken. the largest brained insect? You know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know their brains are small, know. but we're talking about other insects. So. Yeah, I always compare them to humans. So that's where my... <laughs> yeah, our brains are heavy and big. And, okay. yeah. Well, mine is. Mine's huge. But, <laughs> so. so, all right. So they're smart and they can learn. What What other examples do we have of bees learning through observation? Apis mellifera. Are there other examples or just well, that's that's the first. So that's the first observational okay. learning that's been demonstrated in Apis mellifera. Okay. Well, I'm glad we came back to recap that because it gives people just that much more to appreciate. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Heather. I thank you. It. Okay. And that concludes another interview in my series. I hope you learned something new and that you may be inspired by honeybee communication as well as their ability to learn through observation of other bees. As Heather explained, we often end up with more questions than answers. Please visit the video description for links and information. Thank you for watching and listening. I'm Frederick Dunn, and I wish you all the best with your bees.